Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by unbeaten cruiserweight David Light. David, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me. Bit, bit jet lagged? Yeah, uh, yeah, still, but you know, we're getting acclimatized, coming all right. Glad to hear it. Um, let's start from the start because you haven't boxed in the UK before, so it's good to get an idea of your journey, if you like. Looking at Wikipedia, which isn't always reliable, you come from quite a big family and apparently your dad's quite a well-known figure just tell us a little bit about that oh yeah yeah. um i don't know if it's still you still have it around easio products you know the little bullet thing that you had on your kitchen bench you made your own yogurt i think it became big in the uk for a little while Um, Mm. so he invented that company the same year i was born and built it up to a big thing and made a bunch of money so yeah good on (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> can, can we say your birth inspired the uh, creation of easier <laughs> yeah well i'm his eighth kid so uh making your own food probably became a bit of a priority for him <laughs> what, what was it like growing up with seven siblings obviously being the youngest as well well my um my elder siblings are triplet girls um so yeah they were quite a bit older than me so they pretty much moved out by the time i was growing up so i just grew up with uh four brothers so right, only been, four. Yeah, it's all yeah. right. <laughs> but being a runt of, uh, they were pretty wild guys. So it's probably explains why I'm in boxing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that kind of follows on to the next question. How did you find the sport? Uh, my brother, he got into boxing. My um, middle middle brother, and the um, it was just something that didn't even occur to me that you could do in New Zealand and far away from the rest of the world. But I remember seeing his fight. He had it recorded and just thought it was amazing and so he took me out the backyard and then beat me up a little bit and then I uh, got got the neck of it <laughs> how old were you uh, back then I was probably I don't know I was like eight or ten or something uh, back then but yeah and when you eventually got involved properly like went to a boxing gym and started working on the bag and sparring and so on did you take to it naturally or was it a bit of a tough learning curve I was sort of in an outlet like, because I was trying to play tennis um, my dad wanted me to be a wanted me to be a tennis star or something but i sucked at it um but <laughs> there was a lot of uh crossover between tennis and um boxing so um i i really jumped into it properly when i was like 14 and gave up on that stupid tennis and and got properly into boxing what was the crucial thing that made you pick boxing was it just that you were better at it or did you enjoy it more what was the why of boxing not tennis in the end yeah i i did enjoy it more um <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was being, you know, tennis can drive you insane, man. Like you get real angry. I think I broke about 20 rackets in um, my five years of trying to be a professional tennis player. And uh, I could take that anger out in a more healthy way in boxing, I think. (laughs) And is there a bit of crossover there? I'm thinking, especially with footwork. Yeah, footwork, um, just the natural movement of your body um, to like generate power, quick power um, into your shots. Um, I think it's given me a pretty good right hand. So yeah, I think there's a bit of crossover. Good stuff. Now you were a long time amateur. I know you won the silver at the Commonwealth Games. Didn't turn pro till 2017. Were you kind of trying to secure a place for the Olympics the year before? Yeah, I was. Um, I was hoping, you know, I don't know. I, back at that time, I was hoping that doing well at the Commonwealth Games would get the country to support me for trying to make the Olympics and I'd get some funding behind me and support but that didn't really um, eventuate so I was a bit of an amateur purist back then so I thought oh, it was all amateur boxing and I uh, didn't really have much respect for the pro game but um, so I sort of just gave it up but yeah coming back into it now my my uh, coach who I was used to box with back then um, he was saying, you know, I'm 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 training some good fellas out in West Auckland. So when you come out and then just since then it's just been, yeah, it's it's got us to where we are now. <laughs> How has your attitude kind of changed from being that amateur purist and, and not thinking a great deal of the pros to where you are now? Because as an unbeaten pro on the cusp of a world title shot. Well, I think it was back then like the kind of pros that were coming out of New Zealand were just like you know, you can be a certain type of pro. You can be a kind of pro that just fights bums and all that kind of thing. Or you can be a pro that's really going for it and trying to be the best. And um, that's what we're doing. We're only trying to be the best. So um, 
yeah, I, I guess I just saw a lot of guys that just struggled in the amateurs and they went pro and then all of a sudden there's a lot of attention on them and they're gaining popularity and they're gaining um they're getting a lot of followers and stuff. And you think, man, you you knew them when they were in the amateurs and how much they struggled. And then now that it's in pros and everyone thinks it's their way more skilled or something. And that was just not we knew what the truth was. And but yeah, it's just the amateur thing ended, you know, like it does for everyone. And um, yeah, pros, it's good. It's, it's 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 when it gets to a certain level, it's really good. And have your ambitions changed as you've gone up through the rankings or when you turn pro, were you always kind of focused on, I'm going to get a world title someday? Yeah, I was never for like just fighting bums in your local rsa or something and getting all your friends to come and think that you're the man because you're fighting someone that you've just who's just there to collect a paycheck and basically you've dragged them off the street um we we got through 10 fights in one year so that we could get ranking and then we could start fighting serious fights so we rushed through that beginning process to get a ranking and then ever since then it's been you know hard fight after hard fight um international fights traveling and doing all that so and because you've been on that WBO route for a while you've won like three different WBO regional titles have you had your eye on Lawrence Okoli specifically for a while as well kind of studying him because he's been the WBO champion for a while yep that's how it's been um we've you know we know that the the WBO route was the route that we were taking um you have to make some sort of plan and so that's we always sort of knew that this was eventually where we were going to end up and you were the away fighter in your last fight, both geographically and promotionally, uh, against Brandon Glanton. Had to get off the floor to secure a victory as well. Presumably, it was a split decision, but presumably it was a bit clearer than that in your mind, given you were on away turf. Presumably, it wasn't as close as the card said, but it's it's hard to find the fight online. I don't know if you found that. Oh, yeah, I think it's on Pro Box TV or something. They have yeah, so you have to pay thing. for it, yeah. <laughs> so they have to take yeah. it off YouTube, which I don't blame yeah. them for. <laughs> yeah, what was your reflections on the fight? Well, I um, I think it's pretty clear that I slipped on that, you know. I'm um, not trying to talk crap or anything. If you knocked me down, I would say so. But um, I think it was pretty clear that he missed the punch and that my front foot went out and I... But... um. You know, and if you didn't count that knockdown, then there wasn't a single judge that thought he won that fight. Um, and they're all American judges, you know. Everything was completely against us, and we came away with the win. So, um, yeah, but knowing, you know, just knowing boxing, pro boxing, and being the away fighter and all that, you know, you assume you have to basically knock them out for a draw kind of thing. And there we are. Um, so... I was just, I did kind of feel that maybe it would go the other way, but when it went our way, we um, were happy. So I can't, you know, I got a lot of confidence in the, um, that we're going to get uh, fair judging from the WBA. So I'm happy yeah, with that. Not, not only that, it must give you confidence that you've gone to someone's backyard and, and overcome all that adversity ahead of doing it again, hopefully for you against Lawrence Acoli. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, um, it seems like the WBO, uh, you know, they have, they hold their integrity really high. So, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's it's just not it's not worth thinking about anyway because it's just you just go in there and you do what you do and you leave the judges to do what they do. But it's good to know that um, that you're going to get a fair rap. And for people in the UK that haven't seen you box, how would you describe your own style? Um, well, I like to. I like to keep the pressure on. I like to think of myself as a bit of a pressure fighter and I like to scrap it out. I just love scrapping and I love, but you know, I love changing what I have to do. Every fight's different. You know, you got to take, um, you got to mold your sort of um, style around the guy that's in front of you. So, you know, I like to think of myself as a versatile fighter as well. And you've got four world champions, of course, in the cruiserweight division. Is Lawrence Cody the best of the bunch in your view? Not just because you're fighting him, but do you rate him as the best in the division? Um, I'm not too sure. I haven't seen some of the other guys. Um, but, you know, yeah, he's right up there. You know, he's a champion. He's been a champion for a little while. Um, he's held the WO for a good, a good decent amount of time. So there's no, um, there's no knocking him for that. And I know what I'm up against. And, 
I'm not really looking at anyone else, so I can't really answer the question. <laughs> I'm looking at the one guy. <laughs> well, yeah, and you have been looking at him for a while, as we alluded yeah. to earlier. Yeah. What can you tell us about him? I mean, we've obviously got our own view, but you've probably studied him more than we have. What What do you mm. think of Lawrence Okola? Um, you know, he likes to use his height, but he's not just um, he can be he can put on a lot of pressure as well. Um, you know, he's obviously got that big winding right hand, but he's got um, you know, he's got his own weaknesses. So it's um those are the things that we're just looking at and we're looking to exploit and we've been working on ourselves so yeah and you like to get in there and scrap it out as you said he can often we've seen in his fights particularly against um smaller opponents uses his long arms to kind of claim on the inside and to clinch and so on is that something you're kind of preparing for yeah yeah it has been um and we've had guys who are good at that in New Zealand and that we've been working a lot with. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not going to be any excuses or or anything like that. We're just, we just, we got to deal with it as it comes. And um, and I think we will be able to deal with it. His training's been very um, erratic in the build-up to this. Not that he hasn't been training, but with different people. He was long-term yeah. with Shane McGuigan. That ended, uh, and then he was out in Dubai working with some different people, and now he seems to have found a new home with Sugar Hill Steward. How much do you kind of keep an eye on his training situation alongside your own, and, and what do you make of the change of trainers? Yeah, it's not something that I would recommend to anyone, um, changing a lot. Um, obviously, that's his for him to decide what's best for him and how he's going to deal with it. It's not something I would do, but... Um, I'm just gonna, I don't, I don't really make anything of it. Like it's, he's, um, I'm just assuming that he's going to be at his best and that I got to be at my best to win it. So I'm not like building up in my mind that there's anything going to be different because of that really. I mean, how much can you change that much? I mean, he's been with Sugar Hill, I think, what is it like a couple of months? So yeah. how much can it really change? So, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not reading that much into it. What sort of fight do you expect it to be? I mean, or, or what sort of fight do you need it to be if you're going to come out on top? Do I need it to be? I mean, um, I don't, you know, it's, it doesn't matter, really. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, um, he can go one way or he can go another way, and I'm, I've, I've thought of a way to get around it. So it's, um, yeah, it's just, you, you know, but you know, things change, you gotta deal with it. You gotta be a bit flexible, you know, um, with how things would go, in my mind at least. And you won your Commonwealth Games silver medal in the UK. How excited are you to be back? And, and do you think it's a good omen perhaps for your chances? Yeah, I think originally I was supposed to fight in the same place that I fought the for the oh. uh, Glasgow. It was gonna be in Glasgow and it was gonna be in the same arena. So I thought that was pretty crazy, but um it's in Manchester now. But yeah, it's um I don't know. I'm used to being the away fighter now, so I'm used to being the underdog and kind of how I like it. But it's cool to see new places as I go and do this crazy thing we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear. And what are your kind of longer term ambitions? Obviously, winning the world title is a massive achievement, but do you want to go on and unify? Do you want to one day move up to heavyweight, perhaps? What What are the big goals in the future? I'll leave that for after the fight, man. You know, <laughs> I... I uh, I don't think one day beyond, I don't think one minute beyond the fight, you know, it's, um, as far as I can see, it's like the end of my life is, a, is that, is the fight night. So that's all I'm thinking about. You know, we've got plenty of time to think about what the aftermath of whatever happens. So, yeah. <laughs> and, um, just tell us a little bit about your life outside of the ring. Have you got a family of your own yet? Are you, do you work outside the ring? What your, you know, what do you get up to in your spare time? Um, well, yeah, my um, my dad sold up Ezio and he started a new factory making infant formula that he exports to China. So we have got a family business um, canning infant formula and I work in the factory. I've been working there for like almost, well, over 10 years, actually. Jeez. And um, yeah, we just help out. So, so I get to work with my brothers, work, work with all my siblings and that kind of thing. And um, so it's pretty cool. And I also get a lot of time off to do this. So. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't be possible if I didn't have the family business there and um, and that my family was running and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty crazy business that we're in. Um, 
but yeah it's pretty much it that and board games i guess but no i don't have my own family yet um but something i'm working on <laughs> what what's your uh what's your dad like is it you know a bit like logan roy in succession is he you know <laughs> like a very powerful guy with like playing off all his siblings or uh, all his children nah man nah he's a <laughs> super down to earth guy you know he's um super supportive um unbelievably charitable and generous he's like one of the most generous people i've ever known around he's just like shocked me with his generosity wow. growing up um I remember in China, we were walking through and someone just came up and begged him for money. He emptied his entire pockets and gave this guy every dollar he had. And I was like, dude, we're in China. You can't just empty your pockets. You got enough <laughs> money. We're in China. He's like, he needs it more than I do. So um, taking lessons like that from that guy. Yeah. He's, um, but yeah, he's, uh, he, uh, he had a stroke like over 10 years ago, so he can't really talk or much anymore or anything like that. So he's retired now, but yeah, he's um, it's definitely like one of the biggest inspirations of my life. <laughs> and what do you think he'll make of you winning the world title on Saturday night next week? <laughs> um, oh, you know, he's proud of me no matter what. And I think that's um, one of the best things about him is that he's... Um, yeah, he's just an amazingly supportive dad like that. And uh, no matter what we do, he's always going to be proud of his kids. And that's um, one of the reasons that you were able to be so good and be so confident is because we got a dad like that. Oh, amazing. <laughs> well, it's been a, a real pleasure to get to know you a bit better. Um, <laughs> Cheers, next week, Thank of you. course. And um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing you in Fight Week.